funny story. I can't remember my name today. 18 months ago, I was Jason Wright, running guns through Laotian minefields. Last January, I was Derek Adel, explosives expert contracted by the Taliban. After that, I was Marcus Quinn, working security for a Colombian drug lord. But today, I'm this former Soviet Blackwater delivering Polonium 210 to the local mafia. Who am I today? You've done well, Mr. Lang. Ah, oh, that's right. The package has been received. The customer is satisfied. You've earned your reward. Here it comes. I knew I was gonna get burned on this. Never trust a communist. Even one who's turned capitalist. They just have a problem with the idea of fair compensation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Jones of all ages. Welcome to the main event of the evening. It's Talking Joe with Chief and Steve. Hey, hey, hey! Special edition, Talking Joe, Chief Doggy Dog, joined by... S. Job 7. Oh, nice. Nice. Oh, I like yeah. those S's. Very good. Very, Very good. sibilant, like a cobra, perhaps? Ooh, that's <laughs> right, that's right. Listen, he's, he's, he's nailed it there. This is Chief Doggy Dog, Chiefy Two Shoes, the Chief, the Chieftain Tank, and all those other things, along with S. Job 7. Stephen Jubber himself of G.I. Joburg and of course Talking Joe. Now, what we're doing here, if you're not familiar, the Talking Joe podcast is a podcast primarily around discussion of G.I. Joe comic books. And in the main, it is a reread, a discussion, a review, if you will, of a real American hero. So we started way back in November 2018 with Real American Hero issue one. Did the whole of the Marvel run, transferred, segued over into the IDW run with issue 155.5. And we have just concluded a few weeks ago issue 200. So by the time this comes out, we'll be well into the 200s now of the Real American Hero series from IDW. Along the way, we've touched on other things. Transformers G.I. Joe crossover from Tom Sholey. The Transformers G.I. Joe crossover from Marvel way back in the day. Special missions. We've covered the yearbooks and all that kind of good stuff. Along the way, there have been a couple of co-hosts. I like to say a break and replace. So <laughs> started out with the chief and co-host Ben. Unfortunately, he had to part ways. Then Diagnostic 80, which many of you will be familiar with. Diagnostic Chris McLeod, fantastic, running the Full Force podcast. He jumped on due to work commitment he had to jump off and I found this straggler who you mm-hmm. know from G.I. Joe Berg Steve and uh, fortunately he jumped on to do most I just turn up and speak into the mic he does all the, the fancy bells and whistles stuff but I think that's who we are and what we're doing is that right S. Jobs have I got it correct yes there? sir nailed it to the wall chief and for this extra special presentation Talking Joe for the very first time is taking part in Cobra Convergence So if you're watching us on YouTube, that's what we're all about. We are a weekly podcast. So if you haven't yet subscribed to Talking Joe on your podcatcher, what are you waiting for, buddy? (laughs) Do it, do it. Check us out. We're on uh, all the socials, Talking underscore Joe on the Twitter, Talking Joe Comics on Instagram. Hit us an email, talkingjoecomics at gmail.com. Enough of all that good stuff. Like uh, S-Jubs said, we're on Cobra Convergence. What are we actually doing for this special episode, S-Jubs? There was a very special project created by a pair of guys called Mike Costa and Christos Gage with art by Antonio Fuso, and it was called G.I. Joe Cobra. What a perfect comic series to discuss in Cobra Convergence and something that is a complete break from the norm of G.I. Joe, a real American hero. We'll be covering issues one to four of this Cobra miniseries. The first issue was March 2009, so we're, what, 11 years, 11 years on. Special <laughs> bonus content! I think we should actually have a quick discussion about issue zero. Yes, please. Now, this this is a primer because back in the day, IDW, when they acquired the license to G.I. Joe, as well as carrying on the the Real American Hero story from the original numbering, although they started with issue 155 and a half, they also set up their own continuity, telling Joe stories outside of what people were, were used to. And they had a primer issue issue zero and it had five pages of story for their main gi joe book which was going to launch the gi joe origins book which lasted 20 some issues giving background on characters reinvented backgrounds origins for characters 
and then this Cobra series about what we're going to talk about now. And it was a really good book that kind of set viewers and readers up. And let's dig in and see what these five issue kind of primer pages did for this Cobra series. What is particularly striking to me is that I don't think they name drop it as Chuckles until the very last page. Yeah. And it has you guessing who the heck is this guy? It's a G.I. Joe book like no other. And the style in which it's being told, this is something that you're probably going to hear from me a number of times in this podcast. It's very cinematic, Chief. It's very cinematic. Now, you know, if we look at the creators, like you mentioned, it was Christos Gage, Mike Costa were co-writing. I don't know how they shared those duties and Antonio Fusio was on art. I think Antonio Fusio had done stuff prior, but this was definitely the book that put him on the map. And it, it's a style that we hadn't necessarily seen before on G.I. Joe books. The layouts are very cinematic and kind of the the stark use of, of pencils and colours is very nice. I was very concerned when this book actually came out because I'd read Mike Costa's Transformers. Whether or not they came out at the same time, I'm not sure, but I definitely read his Transformers prior to reading this and it was not a good book. He was not good on that at all. And so I was a bit concerned when his name was on, on this as a writer. Having said that... It was almost like night and day, 180 degree U-turn. It was You could not tell the writer was the same guy on that other book because this is just balls to the wall greatness from page one of this zero issue. Nice technique used. Very cinematic once again in using the montage to give you an idea of this character's history. We won't dwell too much on this issue zero, but straight away it tells you that something about deep cover because he mentions he's been running with colombian drug lords the taliban he's been a gun runner so he's been you know with the worst of the worst you know in his deep cover roles and then meets someone at the end or in the middle of these five pages has to dispatch some bad guys and at the end like you mentioned someone calls in and basically you know says you're going in deep deep cover and then you see chuckles burning his passport so you know mm -hmm. shit's about to go down if they didn't name drop Hawk and Chuckles, you would have no idea this was a G.I. Joe book. That kind of anonymity is very, very cool to me. It's so fresh. That's something I wanted to ask you in general about this book. Obviously, we are introduced to a lot of G.I. Joe character names we know. Maybe they're acting or they're in different roles or different backgrounds to what we're used to but we know the names and their general characteristics remain the same. But is there a certain point where it becomes a G.I. Joe book or could this, if you take away those G.I. Joe references, could this have literally just been a an undercover spy book? How ingrained is it in G.I. Joe is what I'm saying? Uh, I think the beauty of this book is it adds credibility to the mythology of G.I. Joe. On one end of the spectrum, you've got red and blue lasers and nobody dying, everyone bailing out of their stricken aircraft with parachutes at the last second. And on the other edge of the spectrum, in the ultra-realistic sense, where every action has its consequences, where characters are vulnerable, no one is this kind of superheroic soldier archetype. This is leading the charge in that realism, where the stakes are always life and death. This is where it's at. Yeah. I must issue at this point a spoiler warning these four issues set up the storyline for things to come of a fantastic series of books, but also have some pretty hardcore events happen in their course. Yes, yes. So um, anyone listening to this who's not read these books and wants to remain spoiler free, I'm going to issue that warning and say, switch off now. You can turn back. Yeah. If we've already hooked you, <laughs> well, then prepare to be spoiled. Yeah. Shall we get stuck into issue one? Let's do it. Entitled, Charmer. It makes me sit with my back to the door, facing east, so the sun is in my eyes. This place has one window, sawdust on the ground to soak up the puke, or the blood. The whiskey tastes like it was distilled in a pig trough. And that's what you get at 10.30 a.m. in Estonia. This is my third shot, but I act like it's my tenth. Very pleased you could make it, Mr. Long, Atul, Martin. 
<laughs> Which alias do you choose for yourself today? A mercenary would have a lot of demons to drink away. Of course, so do I. You can call me Chuckles. Straight up in front and centre, we see Chuckles. He's, you know, in a bar. And I like the fact that he's kind of gone Sherlock Holmes straight away on this bad guy that he's conversing with because he's he's thinking, OK, he's smoking French cigarettes. You know, his teeth are capped. Those those breakies, he's, he's sussing the guy out. He's talking about his wrist and the accent. So he's already in spy mode and just Sherlock Holmesing the whole situation, which is really cool. Yeah, man, such layered writing. You know, it does read like a film storyboard. We've got exterior establishing shot, then a push in interior, close ups of hands, close ups of weapons, close ups of faces, and then a big reveal. The only thing that doesn't make this perfect for one to one translation to the screen yep. is the heavy reliance on narration to fill in the story yes. that, as you would agree, film is a show don't tell medium. The narration in this book is really the heart and soul of the storytelling. We love the insight into Chuckle's mind. And it's, yeah. as you say, he's sleuthing it out. He's also got a kind of a funny banter and one that also shows a great deal of sensitivity and vulnerability. This is a truly three-dimensional character and we're already getting to see that within these first few pages. Like you said, the, the book is multi-layered. The character himself becomes multi-layered. He goes on a journey, he goes on a, a very defined character arc, which doesn't actually conclude at the end of this series. Like you said, it builds into further books. And although this miniseries can, you know, hang by itself, there's definitely when it ends, you're like, oh man, I now need to get the next chapter to, to find out where this actually ultimately goes. But yeah, this first issue is a great setup issue. It's I like to think of it as economic storytelling because they're giving you a lot of information in not too many story pages. So immediately you see members of the Joe team, they, they kind of bust in on this conversation in this bar and Chuckles has to make a decision. We find out later on, but the gun that he's firing has got blanks and where he seems to the bad guys to be shooting G.I. Joes, they've got blood bags and he's shooting blanks, etc. But he has to make it look realistic so he can get on side and maintain his deep cover. We don't see much of the Joes, but what we do see has got a wonderful sense that these guys are the best of the best of the best. Chuckles himself is caught saying, they're already inside so fast and smooth like water running over a floodplain. Yeah. Man, this stuff is poetic. Yeah, yeah, it's gold. It's <laughs> I mean, you ask, can you strip away the G.I. Joe elements and would it be the same story? Yes, but for G.I. Joe fans... The reward in seeing G.I. Joe presented so realistically is immense. We never thought that Joe could be this gripping yeah, until exactly. now. Nice technique with the action sequences using a completely red palette. Like when the gunfight is on, we are seeing just red and black inks. A stark contrast to the panel above where Scarlet and Duke have bust in. And then as soon as a gun is being fired, like you said, red pallets in action. You know, mm, clever stuff. Stark relief. Yeah, lovely technique. And it's something that they're consistent with as well. Whenever there's severe violence, the palette washes to that blood red and heavy inks. Yep. Nice. Great bit of action. As you say, a lot of storytelling. But this is an action-packed issue. And the correlation between Chuckles in this retelling of his story and Daniel Craig in his initial outing as James Bond has been made before. Right. Another Cobra Convergence contributor, Retro Blasting, made a video uh, just pointing out how Daniel Craig in that opening sequence of Casino Royale is Chuckles even down to the floral shirt. <laughs> yeah. But Chuckles wore that shirt before Bond. Oh, you may have a point there, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yep, so yep, maybe yep. they copied it. But um, as you progress through this issue, you kind of do get that, that twist reveal because at the point of time of reading the book, you see Chuckles and he is shooting. It looks like he executes Roadblock and shoots Scarlet. And so you're left wondering at that point, reading in real time, what's actually happening here? His, is Chuckles actually a member of G.I. Joe? Has he actually gone bad? You know, you don't know. And it's not until... You get the scene titled Months Ago, where there's a, there's a debriefing. And this is where you find out that Hawk wants him to go D 
deep undercover. We love a little bait and switch. Yeah, how clever to string you on like that, to keep the ambiguity in the air. Though, yeah. Chief, do you realise that uh, they switched out Roadblock with Heavy Duty? Oh, sorry, yes, of course, sorry, yes. Back in this era, Heavy Duty had kind of surpassed Roadblock in terms of notoriety, which is weird, but... It was a hangover from the toy line, which had Heavy Duty in the Sigma-6 line, and then Heavy Duty again in Rise of Cobra, the feature film, uh, which yes. we will not speak any further on. <laughs> okay, yes, you're right. It's crazy that they went with Heavy Duty instead of Roadblock, but I think we'll give the writers a pass on that. They weren't crystal ball. They weren't looking into the future and realizing, <laughs> hang on, don't worry, Roadblock will, will quickly reclaim his crown as the premier heavy machine gunner. They, they the didn't team. have the hypno shield. No, either. No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> Here, Hawk Sen, you're a capable field agent, and he says, we want you to go deep undercover. Now, are we led to believe this is Chuckle's first deep undercover mission then? And the scenes from. Uh, issue zero were kind of the start what followed on from this conversation he's having here with hawk you know what i think so i think we're seeing the birth of a character right. he's obviously been selected for the gi joe team because of his skills but hawk has realized subsequent to that that he's not a good fit he has a far better role and this just goes to show hawk's shrewdness i mean he will use his his pawns so to speak he will mold them, hammer them into some new shape, as he's done with Chuckles. Yeah. Pick him out for a role that he had not previously even considered. I think you're right. I think this is the first time Chuckles has kind of adopted that role. And Hawk kind of explains it in that if he didn't make Chuckles do this kind of mercenary work, yeah. Chuckles would have gone into it sooner or later anyway. Yeah, exactly. He exactly. read this man's character and he was like, he is not a team player. You know, there's another character introduced here. I know you're a big fan of her in general and in the ARA stuff, but uh, Jinx pops up. Uh, are you pleased with the way she's kind of introduced in this first issue? What is it with strong females immediately putting the smack down on their subordinate male <laughs> companions? Lady J did it to Flint. Agent Carter did it to that poor mouthy recruit in Captain America, the first yep. Avenger. And Jinx certainly did not disappoint in this issue. <laughs> yeah, man. Jinx's portrayal is fantastic. She's not a red pajama rama wearing ninja who overly monologues while dispatching enemy robots with katanas. Yep, she yep. is smart, savvy, seductive as all hell. But at the same time, she's got an agenda and she will push it, yeah. even to the detriment of Chuckles. And, and we get, this is what I was talking about earlier about this economy of storytelling, because just after on the page where she's kicked Chuckles, we get one and a half pages of information that pretty much covers a large time span, you'd think, but it just tells you everything. You know, you see them on mission in flashback sequences and Chuckles gives one paragraph about Jinx that she's, you know, seven years combat experience, all this martial arts, and she's a field medic. So cool, we've got two panels to show her skills. And then they kind of, four panels of Chuckles just being in different scenarios around the world in deep cover. And the last one silhouetted with him and Jinx, his only weakness, you know, seemingly forming some kind of sexual relationship. And just that one and a half pages is able to do so much in progressing the story. You know how it is, Chief. Time moves faster in a montage. Ooh, it takes a montage. <laughs> <laughs> but here we see that uh, Chuckles has a weakness at this stage for Jinx. Yep. We close out on the big reveal. Yes, this is indeed living up to its title of G.I. Joe Cobra. That symbol perfection uh, we should also mention here as i flick the page to issue two the covers i've got the the howard shaking covers uh comic book legend uh, i know antonio fuso did the b covers but i've got the the howard shaking ones i actually got him to sign all these covers at a convention in london he draws a great i'm just looking at cover one now and cover two with the you think it might be jinx but then it's not because you can see the the little cobra tattoo at the top of her breasts and um, Chuckles is uh, with another female who we'll discuss in this issue. It's the first time I've noticed a kind of a twin tower in the background. Ah, yes, yeah. A little bit of foreshadowing on that cover, isn't it? Uh, whereabouts are they? Because at the start of issue two, it actually says 
it just says the Balkan states. The events of the cover of issue two are moving forward to the Dubai sequences. Right, we'll okay, yes. Yep, yep, this yep. is that female's uh, apartment overlooking the buildings that uh, yep. this shady Cobra organization seems to be doing their misdeeds in. This is another question I'm going to have for you. I think towards the end of issue four, I think when he's making his final report, he mentions the word Cobra or the Cobra organization, but I couldn't find any references during these four issues prior to that of anyone saying that this organization was called cobra i guess they don't want to play the literal card too soon yeah. okay no, that makes sense i mean they they work in the b-a-t acronym but they give it a different meaning i guess they're still trying to massage reality and the gi joe mythology and fantasy to keep it grounded so yeah you're right absolutely no one name drops cobra yeah. Having spoken about Jinx's introduction in, in issue one, she obviously pops up here um, at the beginning of issue two. But very quickly, she actually says uh, she's with Chuckles in a, in a restaurant back room. They're kind of making out. And she actually says, this is our last meet. It's the SR receiver from now on. Now, next couple of pages, we find out what this SR receiver is in a really cool sequence. But her saying this is our last meet, it makes sense in the story point of view because she's out of the pages for quite a while and when she's reintroduced it's it's one of the hardest hitting scenes gi joe's ever had um, and i guess you want her missing from the book to kind of almost forget about that character as if she's oh there's jinx now she's gone and then so the reintroduction of her is a bit more shocking but from a story point of view i wonder why she would break off the comms between chuckles and and home base because you know, now all he's left with is biting down on a bit of tinfoil to make his reports without Jinx. <laughs> my explanation, just off the top of my head, I think it's become more and more difficult for her to establish credible cover. Makes sense. As he gets deeper, the eyes on him become more glaring. So yes. Jinx is feeling the heat by being his, his yep. contact. Yeah, that makes sense. But uh, what a cover story to keep up. I mean, this book doesn't lean into the sexualization too much. But it also doesn't shy away from the implication that Jinx is working in a strip club. She's obviously working the room. <laughs> I'm yeah. pretty sure Chuckles isn't her only customer. No, no. She's a popular lady. So. No doubt. Yeah, like I mentioned, we get the scene where, you know, she's cutting off all communications with him and mentions this SR receiver. We've implanted an SR receiver in your skull. You what? You said you were putting me under for shoulder surgery. <laughs> we did that too. I gave you my life, my career, my identity. I should have figured body parts were next. Stop shrieking like a five-year-old. It's harmless and completely necessary. Then why didn't you tell me before I went under? Because you'd have this tantrum. I preferred you throw it after rather than before. I'm paying this woman by the hour. You can go now, doctor. Yeah, thanks, Nurse Frankenstein. So what is that thing? Does it at least get Howard Stern? Skeletal resonance receiver. It's not always going to be shirtless rebels in the Cambodian jungle. Eventually, you'll find yourself among people with countermeasures. No matter how high-tech a gadget we give you, they'll have something higher to find it. So the only option is to go to the other end of the spectrum. We've drilled a simple RF receiver into your mastoid. We also implanted several dozen other fragments in the right side of your skull. It'll show up on any scan of shrapnel. It uses your skeleton as a receiver. We can send coded messages and dots and dashes. About as crude as it gets. Let's give it a try. Gah! It's like an electric toothbrush in my head! Perfect. To communicate back, you just bite down on some foil to create an interference circuit. If you don't have a sweet tooth, develop one. At some points later on in the issues, he says, oh, now I've got to send my report. And I'm thinking, how long would it take to send a report just biting down in dots and dashes? A long time. And imagine receiving one. You've got this bloody thing buzzing <laughs> in, your, in your head while you're trying to have a conversation with someone. Yeah, and cleverly, that becomes his downfall almost, this SR receiver. Because, you know, we'll find out later on that it's buzzing and beeping away. And, and someone who's laying very close to him manages to, you know, work out what's going on. Chief, can you think of a pop culture analogue to the skeletal resonance receiver? Is there another character that springs to mind that uses something similar? I'm guessing there should be. Ah, indeed. Well, I always think of old Solid Snake in Metal Gear Solid, ah, whose yes. codec just stimulates the, the, the bones of his own ear, so no one else can yeah. hear the secret messages that are being broadcast to him via codec. 
That's, uh, very that's why the old sprite uh, appears to always have a crick in his neck every time he receives a message. Snake, answer me. Snake, snake. <laughs> oh, good. man, I just caught sight of something that absolutely breaks my heart. Chuckles' thuggish accomplice and terrorist toady, a guy called Semyon, says uh, at the strip club, Your girl was very pretty, yes? Very professional. See her again? Chuckle says, yeah. And then the thought bubble is, God, I hope so. Yeah. Now, given the events that take place later, that is an absolutely heartbreaking thing for him to have thought. The man is yep. still clearly smitten. And it's also double-edged because, like you said, I think the intent is, yes, because he's, he's in deep with this girl. But also, yes, he wants to see her again because she's his only physical human contact with home base with gi joe mm. and without her around he's even more alone exactly he says in issue one that she's the only sane person that he speaks to for weeks imagine yeah. how crazy that must be to be so in deep with these like lunatic psycho terrorist organizations that you just can't actually make conversation with anyone real unmonitored conversation it's a mind-numbing uh, situation this boy's in yeah. and, and as well as uh, semion there's the other guy skelton he then bites the big one and goes down in a ball of fire in a flaming car after having been shot because him and chuckles kind of stroll into an ambush in their vehicle and we later find out that uh, mr x as we'll call him for the time being kind of set it up as a as a test for skelton to have his abilities and he obviously didn't pass the test but chuckles did because he survived this ambush um and also one another thing on my notes is here's our first example when we turn the pages of actual uniformed people within this organization and i'm, I'm speaking of the crimson guard uh, although they're not name checked as the crimson guard it just says the guard here in full uniform x is going all out so uh, do you like this design? I know what they were going for at the time. They wanted to revamp, redesign, and renew the old IP. What is odd to me, though, is they decide to draw upon classic designs for equipment that'll come up in the further issues of the series. Yeah. In hindsight, I mean, this is the, this is the problem with hindsight. Like, of course we know that the actual Crimson Guard design is some time-honored perfection from way back. I mean, that is an absolutely beautiful, classic G.I. Joe design. Yep. So, yeah, why good. reinvent the wheel? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I like yeah, what they yeah. did, but I don't love what they did. Because no. you'll never be able to beat the classic. No, no. We also get another familiar face in uh, Erica Leten or Erica Latane. How would you pronounce her surname? I seem to have mispronounced it in my mind, but saying it out loud, Erica Leten sounds like it rings true. Ten or Tain not sure but um she is in all but referenced as baroness she she is effectively the baroness of this continuity is that fair to say absolutely and she's uh, clearly the recipient of a, a lasix <laughs> procedure yes because her classic uh, spectacles are gone but i yeah. like the effect she's the most cunning shrewd and interesting depiction of the baroness i've ever seen we've seen the baroness play men up against each other in the past but i don't think it's ever been explicitly stated that she uses sex as her weapon no, no. in this book she does they're at a dinner party where there's an uh ortolan uh, is made special cooked with all the guts it's ortolan which i guess is the the bird or the name of the dish and uh he's sitting down and you're supposed to eat this hen's bones they puncture your gums and your own blood seasons the meat and you're supposed to wear a towel over your head while you're doing it uh, it's all very secret society kind of stuff i like it and incidentally a real thing okay you did some research could not believe my eyes chief this exists <laughs> i mean it's very shunned at the moment because as it turns out this particular bird the ortolan yes is uh, on the verge of extinction so to consume them is is kind of frowned upon yeah yeah frowned upon probably, probably illegal, illegal yeah. but uh you do indeed cook the whole thing and then consume it you you hold its head and consume the entire bird okay. not something that a vegan like yourself would necessarily be turned on by no. 
part-time vegan. I, I'm now <laughs> declaring myself flexitarian. Oh, all right. Okay, still, yeah, I, yeah. I, I wouldn't suggest it. And clearly it doesn't agree with Chuckles either because he retches it up into the sink. Yes. yes. Which, ironically, is uh, Erica's cue. Yes, like you said, she is cunning and will use all means, including sex. And she's quickly on the scene here, having never really spoken to Chuckles before. She's pulling out, you know, a bottle of port or wine or whatever it is. And there's a silhouetted image, and you can immediately tell from this page alone that wait a minute, something funky's going to happen here. Ah, uh, the boy keeps his guard up around everything but women. Here we get yes. the payoff that his only weakness is not necessarily Jinx. That last page of this issue is a a mirror image of a scene where he was, you know, had Jinx up against a wall. Except this time, obviously not Jinx. It's Erica, and has Jinx immediately been forgotten or like you said is it just a weakness the man has but um good parallels to scenes we saw earlier very clever writing going on here uh, you know really good stuff but i want to just jump back to just before the end of the issue mr x comes in and basically says he wants chuckles to blow up the federal reserve it's got 2.1 billion in it and he wants to to blow it up rather than he's not about stealing the money it's he's a, it's about um sending economies and governments into into panic and disarray more terrorism rather than heists and what's interesting to me is chuckles goes along with it and this is the narrative of the deep undercover spy we've seen it in many movies and other media how far do you go to get to your ultimate goal of presumably bringing down this organization how much bad are you willing to do for the greater good and here he does blow it up and we're kind of told in some of these things that there are civilians and there are innocents inside this building. So he's clearly made the choice that some people are going to get sacrificed for the good of the mission. Yeah, but where is his line and will we learn that? Yeah. Hmm. Is he yes. as mercenary as Hawk uh, made him out to be? Or is there a, a shred of humanity left in this man? Still early yeah. days. This is only issue Still two. Still early days. Yeah. And uh, I think we're about to head into the Empire Strikes Back territory, buddy. So we open up with Chuckles in bed with Erica Leten or Letain. They're together now. And it's easy to forget that Jinx, she's not name referenced. It's easy to forget that she was just a fling he had, even though we think there was potentially more there. But she's a thing of the past in the process of reading these first few pages of the issue. And... Chuckles is now getting deeper into the organisation. But here's a good bit on page two to see his moral compass because he, he says here, uh, the next day we got a lead on a shipment of small arms passing through on its way out of Russia. So we made a deal, double-crossed some people and I blew up a train. I go down to assist the recovery team so I don't have to take part in the executions. So he knows that people are going to be executed, but he doesn't want any part. He doesn't want to actually do the executing. So... He obviously does have a moral compass in that he physically doesn't want to do that. But later on in the issue, you know, maybe he's going to have to pull the trigger himself. A little bit of insight into his humanity. The man has trouble sleeping. Yeah. And the only thing that calms his mind is the presence of a lover. Yep. So th that's the double-edged sword to his weakness. Uh, you got to be careful who you invite back to bed with you, mates, because bam, her eyes are open. Did yes, you catch that, yes. Chief? <laughs> Yeah. He's passed yeah. out. Man, he's spent. <laughs> Shot yeah. his bolt. But That's she it. she's still operating. She is wide awake and fully aware of what's going on. Yeah. Love he is just like he's that. almost running on autopilot at this stage, I think. And his senses have been dulled to the situations, but like you said, you know, don't drop your guard, especially around people like Erica Letain. Um and she she is actually with not Mr. X that we've seen someone even above him which is another twist which is a really cool twist that we'll come on to later but we know dubbed the crimson twins from um ara tomax and zamot we know those guys now in in this we've only seen one of them or what, what one version of one of those characters so you're thinking ah oh, you know the writers have mixed it up here instead of introducing both of these guys they're just going to give us one and that's cool you know nice little twist just getting one of the one of the twins that's fine and she is supposed to be involved with his boss so when she's with Chuckles, she's making it clear to him that she's only acting uh, affectionate towards him when no one else is around because obviously she doesn't want other parties to know. 
but as we'll find out, all parties are actually aware of what's going on all the time. Chuckles seems to be the only one who is clueless in the dark. And also comes back to something that you mentioned earlier. The whole idea of Mr. X being one of the Crimson Twins is something that you don't know at this stage. It's no, no, still that's what completely I mean. yeah. Yeah. ambiguous. They don't overtly lean into G.I. Joe name dropping for the sake of it. No. These no. Easter eggs are, and payoffs still have a level of like uncertainty in your mind. When I was reading this and it was like, oh, uh, Mr. X reports to the commander... Um, who's above him and this, you see this shadowed figure behind closed doors and you're wondering who it is i had forgotten you know, spoiler i'd forgotten it was his brother i actually thought it was cobra commander so when <laughs> the reveal came to me whilst rereading these i was like oh shit yeah i completely forgot that what a great twist well there you go man you fell into the carefully laid trap they do refer yeah. to him as the commander <laughs> they do yeah only to then pull the rug out from under you it's yeah. Fantastic, man. I find this kind of refresh to give you everything that G.I. Joe had, but to introduce it to you very piecemeal, very suspensefully. It's a great way to, to add intrigue to something that, in the main, dare I say it, has gotten a little tired. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Chuckles kind of makes his move in this issue as well. He's, he's just treading water, so he, he goes to Mr. X and basically says, look, let me in. I can do more good for you, etc. And then Mr. X says, yeah, fine, you know, you're fired. And he's like, what? And then so they move him to, this is where he goes to Dubai, isn't it? They move him to the Central Ops uh, to get him more involved in some of the inner workings of the organisation. Chief, double splash, mini poster. Yeah. What are your yeah. thoughts, buddy? It's great. You can see the confidence of the man and the guards because he's not hunched over, cowering behind stuff. He's just standing tall in the middle of a, a field of fire, shooting off the guns as muzzle flashes everywhere. The dark red sky, the plumes of the oil coming up. Great yeah, page. Man. Once again, those reds playing up the, the violence and the, the distinction between his undercover work and his... His dirty work, the, the work that requires a gun. You can see he's been elevated within the organisation as well because, you know, he's doing some interrogations. He's chief of security. He's, in one scene there, he's, you know, training guys. They're shooting at targets. So he's clearly got men under his command now. Uh, he's instructing. But still, we don't know who the commander is. We don't know as a reader and he doesn't know either. And we get a nice slice of moral ambiguity once again. I think it's best summed up in, in his words when he says, I train the terrorists of tomorrow. I train them to kill my friends more effectively. Yep, yep. That is Hard big time. as hell. About the double splash, though, I'm going to say that uh, it has the most dramatic framing at the cost of perhaps its own reality. A gunfight at this kind of range is suicide for all involved. <laughs> yeah. All of yeah. those guys have automatic <laughs> weapons. If they're all spraying at the same time, everybody gets wiped out. Yes, you know, a yes. gunfight like that would happen at perhaps f further ranges, at least in my mind it does. But yeah. if you're doing a, a longer shot than that, it's going to lose dramatic impact. So keep it yes. tight, keep the focus close enough to see Chuckles' face, but have the opposition in the same frame. And therefore... Yeah. You know, you're setting up this opposition, but, you know, realistically thinking about it, it wouldn't play out like that. <laughs> this is suicide. No, I was going to try and no prize it by saying all of the people in this scene are part of Chuckles' team, even the ones in non-Crimson Guard uniforms. And they're all just, they're surrounded by guys that are off screen. But I don't know if that plays. Simeon, what time is it? Time to go. Security is leaky. Leaky all over. There, here. We think we find why. We think you will know why. Me? Why would I know? Because you are clever. Is there a reason why your gun's out? Yes. We have finally caught Spy. You know this woman? Oh my god. Jinx. Stop. After everything, don't stand there and pretend. What? Don't pretend you don't know me after all this time. Sir, our surveillance places this woman in Kabul, Medellin, and Tbilisi over dates when you were known to have been there. How? She must have gotten my transmissions. That means headquarters got them too. 
The bastard killed my family six years ago in Cambodia. You don't even remember me, do you? You used me and you left me bleeding in the corner and you don't even remember my face. She's making up a cover story on the spot. Or maybe she always had it up her sleeve in case she was caught. In case... Oh, God, she's been caught. How am I going to get her out of here? Three years ago, the New People's Army found you in Laos. I've been tracking you since. I would have made my move in Tbilisi if not for these goons. Remember, James? I killed him. Last month, I put a knife through his jaw just like he did my I brother. can't. I can't get her out. We're both going to die here. I think this woman is crazy. I can take Semyon. Maybe even the two guardsmen. But there's no way I can get her out of this bunker and she knows it. So here you are. A big man with a defenseless girl tied to a chair. Do it. Because if you don't, I'll get out of here. And then you're dead. I can't save her. And if I die, the mission is over. These people go on to kill thousands, tens of thousands. We didn't know if you'd want to be in on this, sir. We know you're a busy man. We can take care of her. And I assure you, it won't be pleasant. But we thought you might like to do it yourself. That's one life against thousands. Against bringing all these people down. One soldier's life. Did you hear me? If I leave here, you're dead. So go ahead and do it, you coward! She got my transmissions. She knows something big is coming. She's a soldier. And the mission is everything. Do it! Chuckles is woken in the middle of the night by Semyon. He's talking about security being leaky. And then he says, yes, we have finally caught Spy. And then big reveal. Holy cow, Jinx. And the look on his face. Look at the Crimson Guardsman. One's kind of cracking his knuckles, arms folded. She's at a table. She's obviously been, you know, bloody nose. There's blood on the table. And it's the way that Chuckles where in the panel where he says, oh, my God, in narration, he's kind of, it's pastely whitewashed out. It's not clear, vivid colour. It's almost like the, the colour has drained from his face yeah. because the reality of the situation is like, holy shit, how does this play out now? And, mm. you know, you find out how it plays out. And as a reader reading it for the first time, I, I would. This wouldn't have been in my top ten guesses about how it played out. I don't think this ain't your grandpappy's Captain America comic. That's for damn sure. No, <laughs> no. Jinx, ever the professional Joe, he thinks she's about to shop him out to these bad guys because she says, "I know him. You know how can you do this?" But then she turns it into a cover story by saying, "You know he killed." her family and friends and she's just been out for revenge on him which is why they've possibly been seen together in different locations because she's been hunting him. After that moment three things happen. Chuckles decides he's going to take the initiative and go straight to yep. the top. He, he, he had indecision about what his mission was. Well that moment has crystallised it. Another thing, mm. he ain't cracking jokes anymore. And the third no. thing, all of his thought boxes are now in black. Yeah, that's right. The man right. is right. consumed by the darkness, absolutely. He's, bro he's a broken man, you know, he's come to a point in the mission which, from a, on a deep cover operative, you've, you know, you've got to be thinking about, okay, fine, at some point, how do I extract myself from the mission? And then what happens if I'm on the mission and it goes bad and this situation occurs you know one of my colleagues is captured what is the exfil here how do we get out of it either one of them breaks and spills the beans and in which case they're both dead or how do they get out of it with he actually posits that doesn't he He says listen can i take the gut can i he's, he's thinking about trying to save them both and just blowing off the whole deep cover can he take all three of these jinx has got her hands manacled tied behind her back can he take out semyon and two guards no is the answer so that's not an option. They'd both be dead or they'd both be captured and both be tortured, which would result in both their deaths and the end of the G.I. Joe deep cover operation. Or does one of them get out alive? And there's only one of them that can possibly get out of this situation alive. And unfortunately, it is him. Mm -hmm. So he pulls the trigger and, uh, and kills her, executes her. He rationalizes wow. it down to three things. That she knows there's something big coming. She's a soldier, and the mission is everything. 
blam. Yep. Now, Chief, I fail to think of a single moment in G.I. Joe or in comic book reading at all where there's been a moment as impactful as this. It's gut-wrenching stuff. Yeah, and, and this is such clever storytelling. So like like we've said, like you mentioned previously, it's not a war comic story, because you know a realistic one, because if it was, people would be dying left, right, and center. Obviously, deaths have been introduced to G.I. Joe and American Hero sporadically across the way to kind of add a semblance of realism. But at its roots, you've still got silly vehicles. You've still got silly outfits. You know, you've still got uh, a guy in a blue suit with a rag on his head. I mean, come on, it's not it's not a realistic comic. No one's ever going to mistake it for that. But here, cleverly, they're, they're able to kind of show some deaths, a lot of them off panel, but here... They, they managed to input a moment of such graphic realism and just gut-wrenching drama that it's such a clever line to breach the world of comic books and horrible stark reality together. It's really clever. Killing a teammate and a lover, execution style, doesn't get harder than that. So let's talk about toys. <laughs> 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 oh. Okay, so uh, regular listeners will know that Talking Joe evolved from just talking about comics to a multifaceted segment-based magazine-style show, if you will. There's probably about five or six different segments, Chief singing silly jingles, and one of those segments is uh, Steve Talks About Toys, and uh, what toys do you want to... Yeah, this is a good time to break up the, the heavy anxiety and, and mournfulness I'm feeling right now after that Jinx thing. So what toys have you got to talk about this time? The Crimson Guard Commanders, codenames Tomax and Zamot. Yeah, boy. File name, classified. Birthplace, island in the Mediterranean. Specialty, infiltration, espionage, sabotage, propaganda, and corporate law. Spell the name Tomax in capitals and hold it up to a mirror. It reads Zamot. The same holds true for the actual brothers. Each is the mirror image of the other except for a scar on Zamot's face. Both twins served with the Foreign Legion Paras in Algeria before the officers putsch. They honed their mercenary skills in the bush wars of Africa and South America. They were too smart to be soldiers forever, went to Zurich and became bankers. They quickly found the ins and outs of international finance to be too haphazard for their tastes. They preferred a situation they could control. Cobra was willing to give them access to that control. Now they command legions, but their legions wear three-piece suits and fight their battles in executive boardrooms. These are the most fearsome of the Cobra adversaries. They don't fight with steel and claw, backed with muscle and honest sweat. They chase you with paper, wound you with your own laws, and kill you with the money you loaned them. If you were writing a grounded, realistic, gritty G.I. Joe story, these are probably your logical choice when it comes to a main adversary, because these are the Cobra financiers. They're yeah. money men, and they're dirty as all hell, Chief. Yeah, man. That file card sets it up so nicely. It's a very, very finely written file card. Yeah, it's great. It's great. And I was always, you know, we're going to talk about the toy here, so we won't spend too much time about their comic appearances. However, I am going to talk about it now because they didn't actually appear that much in ARA, and that always made me a little bit sad. I think I would have liked them to appear, but without the the telepathy thing. You know, when <laughs> Flint punches one, the other one feels it. Because how does that work in reality? Whenever either of them does anything, the other one feels it. Bit too hokey for me, and maybe that's why Larry dropped them. But remove that. And I think they would have been great, credible villains, even in that kind of funky ARA guise. Sadly, it wasn't to be. But here, like you said, they make great, suited villains doing what the file card says they do. Figure-wise, um, when did these bad boys come out? The year was 1985. It was Series 4 of G.I. Joe. And Tomax and Zamot were initially going to be just one character. But I think it was Ron Rudat who decided, let's split them up, let's make uh, duplicates. Okay. But interestingly enough, and this is where you really see a sign of the times, in creating duplicate figures, they reversed all their features. So what you're seeing are two figures that look the same, but required two completely different sets of tooling to create them. Yeah. 
These are completely different molds. And they were packaged side by side with mirror cardboard inserts on either side of the figures to give a kind of an almost like infinity mirror illusion. It was an interesting look. I do recall at the time parents being rather concerned that they were being made to pay essentially twice as much for figures that looked exactly the same. But uh, I managed to slip this one past my folks. Okay. Fantastic figures, very, very intricately designed, very ornate figures, but some have gone on to criticize that they look a little bit circus freakish, which kind of plays into the fact that, at least in animation, they had acrobatic skills. Right. And even in the comic book, their initial introduction was in the Arb Co. Brothers Circus. Yeah, yeah, of course. And no mention of this, this shared telepathy. I'm not going to call it telepathy. It's kind of not, but that kind of thing. No mention of that on the file card? No, but once again, I think that was an element that was somewhere in perhaps Larry's initial notes right. on the Crimson Guard Commanders. Of course, this is uh, perhaps something that he drew from a novel called The Corsican Twins. Was that by Alexandra Dumas? Uh, I think so. I'm going to say yes. Did these get many new versions of these characters as, as action figures? Perhaps not as many as you might think, given their importance to particularly the Cobra organization and the mythology. There have only been, I'd say, eight versions, okay. official Hasbro versions, yep. some of them being exclusives, uh, some of them being suited versions, which is oh, nice, nice to see. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, in, in the cartoon series, it seemed like Tomax and Zaymont were equal parts seen in their suits as they were in their... Crimson yeah. Guard commanders uniforms. And in, in the comics, we don't actually see them doing much Crimson Guard commanding. We kind of just see them, you know, on their own or squabbling with other members of the higher Cobra command. Well, isn't it great that G.I. Joe Cobra serves to put that right? It sure because is. it is evident in issue number four that they are indeed calling the shots in the Crimson Guard. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's jump back to the comic then. Issue number <laughs> yes. four entitled Eyes. Yes. Mm. Where do you want these, sir? This is who they have me working with now. As head of special projects. B12. Max something or other. Can't be older than 24. Wiz kid poached from Caltech. From Semyon to Doogie Hauser. His dad is some sort of Euro trash money man. I'm sure that's a big part of why he's here. He's a good kid, really. Too bad he has to die with all the rest of them. So, like you mentioned, and I, again, this is what you do on Talking Joe all the time. You pull out these little nuggets that slip by me. And I hadn't, until you mentioned it when we were talking about the previous issue, the back end of three, I hadn't noticed that all of his narration boxes changed to black. And now I'm flicking through, and yes, they are. And this is signalling... The changing of the man, Chuckles, you know, this is, he's hes now where we thought he was coasting and running on empty. He now has a singular vision and he's almost re-energized, having dispatched his former lover. Now his, his one goal is bringing these turkeys down and straight from the off, he's got C4 in his hands and he's reprogramming. Nice to see the, the, the BATs. Here they're called Battalion Automation Tactics. <laughs> Arose by any other name, right? Yeah. Also nice to see they don't work because, you know, it's easy in ARA to, oh, let's make these bats. Oh, look, they're these indestructible automated killing machines. But here, literally after one page, they're deemed to be non-serviceable. <laughs> they don't work. And it's nice to, to bring something over from another continuity and not just replace it and it's a you know a fix or it's just oh we've got these things but they're crap they don't work well would you believe it's canonical to their file card that they have difficulty discerning friend from foe oh nice yeah it's once again a wonderful nugget that the writers have in gi joe cobra that the bats are extremely unsophisticated ai <laughs> in fact they're deployed into areas uh, not safe for regular cobra troops Basically, as a kind right. of a, a sapper tactic, you know, you, you, you don't want to mix them in with regular troops because they might conduct friendly fire. <laughs> <laughs> so they're kind of used to evacuate an area more than more than to walk alongside. Yeah. Do you uh, like the Easter egg being the Cobra Hiss tank? 215. Mm. 
Yeah. So they've decided to lean into a classic design there. And I suppose if you're going to do it with one design and you're not going to do the Crimson God, well, it's got to be the Hiss. There is nothing in this world quite like it. And Cobra has no greater trademark apart from their own symbol than the Cobra Hiss. Yeah, correct. Immediately followed by a panel which I could only call <laughs> Origami Drones. Uh, yeah. What yeah. the hell are those, Chief? No idea. I kind of just glossed past Some it. Some kind of sophisticated jet fighter that looks literally like folded paper. <laughs> yes, yeah. We do get a sense of scale of this organization, though, because previously we'd only seen guards in their ones and twos and like upper management and hadn't really seen vehicles. But this page, like you said, it shows the his tank, these origami vehicles. Uh, we see some some heavy munitions here some sort of bombs or things and then we get an overhead shot of lots of troops so this is clearly a bigger organization than we'd first seen maybe chuckles knew that but the reader hadn't seen it to that scale but now we're starting to understand how big these scumbags are and not a moment too soon of course you can't keep up this super realistic spy thriller thing for too long i mean cobra is about the tech cobra is about people wearing masks. I'm glad they're introducing these elements, but in a believable yeah. way. And what's also believable is the fact that Chuckles is not completely consumed by his quest for revenge. He's still a human being, and we see him retching up his, his lunch, effectively. The man is tortured. Yep. Like we said, he's broken. He's now got kind of a renewed vigor in terms of completing the mission, although we don't know ultimately what his orders were in terms of what he was supposed to do and when was he supposed to extract when had he got enough information to get out he probably wasn't supposed to be the one to bring the organization down physically with c4 and explosives i'm 100 percent sure of that you know he was supposed to come out with intel more planning and then they work around what they're going to do but he's taking it upon himself due to you know no doubt the jinx situation that this is now his baby to deal with personally it's, um, something that is not uh, playing into his human emotions is obviously the fact that his relations with Erica have kind of become very cold, very detached. Yes. I yep, guess, yep. Yeah. how could he fall into the arms of this other woman knowing yeah. the blood that's still on his hands with Jinx? Yeah, yeah. And from that page onwards, Chief, the pulse-pounding stuff happens for me. Even on the reread when I took down some notes for this chat... Yep. This stuff got me going, man. I'm like, whew, the <laughs> righteous vengeance is about yeah. to come. This man is on a suicide mission. He doesn't care yeah. about his yeah. own life. He doesn't care about the mission. Now it's personal. Now it's time. Yeah. Ultimately, he wants to know who the commander is, doesn't he? Yeah. Before taking everyone down. So he, he's chucked semi on through a window. He's got Mr. X gun to the head, marching him up to the top floor of the building to find out who's there. Erica's there. And then, you know, the big reveal sitting in the chair as he turns around. Wait a minute. That face looks familiar. Same face, brother. Damn. That's it. And I love that twist when they mention that it could have been either or one of them in any of the meetings that Chuckles has had over the past X amount of time. X, no pun intended. But, you know, he could have been meeting Zaymot on one day and the next day he could have been meeting Tomax, but none the wiser. Of course, they are completely indistinguishable from one another, slipping into each other's roles. Until one of them gets a scar. <laughs> yes. Uh, match, uh, the action figure, yeah. Chief, do you have any idea how to tell Tomax and Zaymot apart? Which one do you think is the scarred twin? In the A-Ra? In any continuity, which twin bears the scar? I'm going to say it is Zaymot. Very good. Yeah, man. Okay. Although, me and Ben always used to call him Examot. <laughs> so did I. Yeah. Me and my buddies too. Uh, anyone listening to this wanting a shorthand? And I'm going to credit FormBX257 also on YouTube with this uh, fine little bit of uh, word association. X marks the spot. Ah, nice. The marked twin is Zaymot. I didn't actually know that. Uh, that was a guess. Well, now you'll never forget it, Chief. Hey! It wasn't, it wasn't a guess because I know he's just turned around in the chair and said his name's Tomax. And I know the guy that Chuckles had gun to the head must have been Eximot there. <laughs> Eximot, must have been Zaymot. <laughs> and obviously 
he's the one who chuckles shoots a blank in his face which then creates the scar so i didn't know if that was mirrored across yeah. the a as the well sneaky erica she replaced all his live ammunition with blanks but let yes. me tell you pal a blank will still put out a gout of flame and discharge and gas that will do a nasty number to someone's cheek if you're pulling it at point blank range and the reason she had replaced all of his bullets with blanks is because they know that he is a G.I. Joe agent and they've known for quite some time. And this is where we get the reveal. And they say, we know you work for G.I. Joe. We've known for months. Why do you think we brought you here? Erica, she noticed your sternum vibrating in code the first night she spent with you. Told us immediately, of course. So that was his SR receiver vibrating. Payoff, just in case you didn't see that her eyes were open in that first yeah. encounter they had with her yes. supposedly sleeping on his chest. There may not be over action happening on these pages, but it's filled with tension. You know, it's filled with reveals and shock and cleverly played out plans. You know, great stuff. <laughs> Anytime a bad guy who you've got at gunpoint says, if you give yourself up now, it'll be quick. But if you continue down this path, it's going to get messy. Anytime that kind of threat is made, it makes my skin crawl, Chief. This would be great as a cinematic scene, yeah. Uh, well, it's been bandied about more times than I care to count in fan culture that if there was a, a series ripe for a Netflix live action show, it was this. It yep. seems like it's written in that structure. It's, it's begging for it. And I think everyone, after reading G.I. Joe Cobra, was also begging for this to be made live action. It's gripping stuff, and it might even net whole new audiences to the G.I. Joe mythology. Yeah, yeah. And and these bad guys, this um, Zaymot and Tomax, they're, they're not panicking. They, you know, they know he's G.I. Joe. Where does he go from here? I mean, he's just losing... By the second here, he's lost his former lover by his own hand. The Dubai Cobra facilities are in ruins and bats are laying waste to Tomax and Zamot's headquarters. Tomax and Zamot with Erica in yeah. tow escape to the chopper. Semyon yeah. gets his comeuppance, a nice bullet to the head at close range. Yep. What I'm interested to know is Chuckles has an encounter on the staircase. Who is the girl in the black shirt? Yeah. She's quite prominent in that panel, but not name-checked, not referenced, and not seen again. But, yeah, interesting. Is it Jinx? Is he saying goodbye to her finally? This quest for revenge was posited as his way of saying goodbye to her. Yes, they've got a way. We've got the reveal about who the head snake, as it were, these, these brothers, Erica's in tow, like you said, He's managed to blow up this facility, but he couldn't sneak C4 into certain sections. But that's why he's got the bats to come in and take down this building. But they've escaped. Has he done enough? No, he's not done enough because he even says that on the final page. You know, I will find them if it's the last thing I do, and it will be. And that's quite chilling as well. So he's saying, basically, he's going to find them, and then his life is done. That's satisfaction enough. And then if he dies in the cause of bringing them down, he's happy with that. Yeah. Wow. Sacrifice play. Man, it is on. And if you don't want to carry on reading more of this after having read that, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> and you are not a G.I. Joe fan. Now, if you do want to go on and read it, the next timeline issue, I think, is G.I. Joe Cobra Special. And this is it's just a one-off special from September 2009. And this is an interesting one. We're not covering it now, obviously. But this is an interesting one because I think it's an issue which is told in reverse so you get half of the issue is told from Zaymot's point of view and then half of the issue is told from Tomax's point of view so go and check that out that is the G.I. Joe Cobra special oh so chief I'm out. pumped baby I think I'm gonna do that right now <laughs> yeah man uh, how do you want to go about uh, giving this a Yojo Coleridge what are you giving it out of 10 sir oh chief I'd be remiss if I didn't give it a 10 out of 10 it is so fresh so unique and yet still has a G.I. Joe flavour to it. This is perhaps the definitive chuckle story. In fact, I'm not even gonna put any doubt in anyone's mind. I regard this as the ultimate representation of chuckles and I'm not alone. So yeah. to give it anything less than 10 I think would be an insult to a story that defined a character 
and a story that really just shows us that G.I. Joe has the most infinite depth of stories to be told. This well yep. goes on and on and on. And if it seems like G.I. Joe stories have been stagnating, well, I urge you to read this and try and make that argument. Yep, agree, agree. I'm looking at my master list and I think I've only given out four tens for all G.I. Joe stories. And quickly looking, they are the Cobra Island shenanigans from the back end of the 40s. Issue 34, which is the Ace versus Wild Weasel. Issues 26 and 27, Origin of Snake Eyes. And issues 42 and 43, Ties That Bind. They all got 10s. I'm giving this a 10, which for me currently makes it an all-time top five G.I. Joe story that I've ever read. So there you go. Before we go, just going to throw some quick shout outs. Guys, this episode of Talking Joe has formed part of Cobra Convergence 5. If you have no idea what Cobra Convergence is, well, it's a collaborative event taking place in August. Someone is putting out some new G.I. Joe content every single day, and it's a great way of perhaps finding out the depth of content, fan content, that exists out here on the interwebs. Yesterday was Scorched Earth Creations, and tomorrow you're going to be treated to Merry Mercenary Cosplay. Links to their content will be in the description either in your podcatcher or in the YouTube video description, so just scroll down and take a look. Brilliant. Really loving Cobra Convergence right now. First time Talking Joe's been on it, so great stuff. Good place for lots of content providers and creators to, to get together and show off the wares. So Chief, we're in good company, releases. bro. Yeah, we're man. here with yeah. G.I. Joburg in the full force. That's it. You know it, baby. You know it. You know it. All uh, ex-alums and a current a current uh, alum of Talking Joe co host Don't know if that's a word or not. But um, we thank you for tuning in and listening to this special talk Talking Joe episode as part of Cobra Convergence. Hopefully you'll join us on the regular channels. But with all that said and done, we will catch you down the road. We've been Talking Joe. And we're all out of Joes. Yo, Yo Joe! Joe!